Okay, Governor, I think uh, first let's just talk about the big picture here. Sitting in that chair now for about a month, but now the legislature is going. You've signed some executive orders. Uh, you're having to deal with a, a weather event now, a major weather event. Uh, has it been like what you've expected so far? It's been a lot, and I'm, really, I'm enjoying it. I'm uh, very thankful. I've got an incredible staff, uh, chief of staff, and the cabinet positions that we've uh, appointed thus far have been absolutely incredible. We're working together uh, on solid ground, been working with legislative leadership, and got over there yesterday to talk to some of the legislators, and looking forward to the session. Talk to me a little bit about uh, one of the major efforts that you've had to undertake so far is dealing with, trying to deal with this plutonium shipment that came in from the Department of Energy. Um, so another effort by your administration to try to stop any future shipments. What is this looking like to you? What, what do you think the danger is still to Nevada? And what are the options that the state has? It's a big concern, obviously, of mine. Before we even got here, the, uh, before I got elected, the shipment had already come to Nevada. And I've had numerous conversations with uh, my predecessor, with Governor Sandoval, and what he was aware of, what he wasn't aware of. And with our different agencies as it relates to that, it's a big, big concern of mine what's exactly out there what's been stored, what their plans are to, for the material that's there, if they're planning on bringing any more. It's, uh, I've talked to everybody in our federal delegation as it relates to this, and it's, it's kind of hard to nail these folks down, but we're going to continue to pursue every option that's available uh, to me and to our delegation to prevent this from happening. This is a little bit different than the Yucca Mountain effort, mm -hmm. obviously, because this is already existing federal property. This is the Department of Energy doing their transfers, does that limit the scope of what you can do in your opinion? Well, I think that it presents some unique challenges as it relates to that. And the other challenge we've got is, as I said, what's already there and, and what's going to happen to what's there. It's a secretive situation. Uh, there's no way to really get in and uh, audit what's available, what's been there, what's been placed there, and what their long-term plans are. And we've got to work on uh, the best representation that they make us uh, make to us. And it's a good faith discussion. Unfortunately, this came as a big, big surprise to me and to Governor Sandoval. This came as a big surprise. Now, I understand that they're claiming it has, there's some security involved with it, national security and whatnot, but I think it's incumbent upon the federal government to at least let us know what's going on. And, and Representative Titus told me last week it could be up to six tons of additional uh, plutonium that, that needs to go somewhere potentially here. Well, according to the uh, District Court uh, South Carolina decision, there's six more tons going to have to be disposed of, and I certainly hope that's not coming here. Uh, but there's no way of knowing. There's no way of knowing what's already there. And uh, it's a big concern. I mean, it's a concern that it's being stored there. It's a concern about how it got there, the travel route, and how safe that is when it's being transported. I want to switch to uh, the topic of, of taxes and, and uh, funding some, some of the uh, initiatives that you're pushing forward. Uh, a lot of support so far uh, from both sides of the aisle talking about not increasing taxes. But we're starting to hear a few rumblings from Republicans about uh, the idea that not allowing a tax to sunset in, is in effect, effectively to them a tax increase. How do you respond to that? A tax was, in place, uh, was put in place years ago. I mean, the sunset that's extended is not a new tax. It's just extending a current tax that was meant to sunset. That's not the same as a new tax. And we've had some discussions. I'm sure we're going to continue to have discussions as it relates to that and hope I can get everybody on the same page. So to you, this is more of a Nevadans are used to paying uh, what they've been paying, so they'll just continue at the current rate. These are taxes that are currently in place right. that people are paying today and they'll continue to pay them. And if someone wants to propose, if some of the opposition to that want to propose cutting Meals on Wheels or cutting money that we're putting into education or mental health or any of the other programs that we've decided to step up the funding, let them tell me what they want to cut. Governor, you uh, uh, promised uh, back in 2017 when you were running uh, that you were going to get collective bargaining rights for state employees. You uh, uh, kept that promise by putting that into the, uh, the uh, state of the state uh, speech, but I, th there wasn't a time by which that should be implemented. How soon do you think that should be implemented? This, this uh, session? Well, I don't know if it can be practically done this session. I mean, with the, you know, the intricacies of dealing with it. I mean, I'm dealing with, uh, working with both Senator Atkinson and uh, Speaker Farson to come up with a plan. I mean, they've been spearheading this effort. Uh, it has to be implemented over phases. It certainly can't be done all at one time. Uh, and we're gonna work through that. Um, the Republicans uh, say that that is going to uh, increase cost to the state, labor cost to the state. Uh, 
uh, so that in future years this could be uh, quite unmanageable. Do you agree with them at all? Do they have any kind of a point there? Well, no, I think it's certainly uh, going to get some of our state workers wages that they've been deserving for a long time. I came from Clark County where we have collective bargaining and it's not bankrupted the county. It's not taking up the entire county budget and oh, woe well, me, the sky is falling as some people are saying. Uh, the pay disparity that exists between local government and state government is enormous. And it's something that came over a period of time. It's one of the reasons it's difficult to attract the best people in state government sometimes because the pays just aren't commensurate. So I think it's something that's long overdue. Yeah. Did, did you, would you say that your experience in local government uh, uh, dealing with collective bargaining there influences your, your opinion about how it can be implemented and the, re the realistic chances of it being implemented and the uh, practical applications of how it's going to be implemented? I do. I think that the experience and the background that I got at Clark County as it related to collective bargaining, and we dealt with several unions in Clark County, you know, that uh, had collective bargaining, and I think that it's a give and take type situation. I mean, it's not going to be uh, a catastrophe as some people are laying out the prognosis for. I think it's something that is long overdue. It'll be phased in over a period of time. This isn't something that's just going to flip the switch and one day it's going to happen and wages are going to go up enormously. It's going to be done over time and these are going to be negotiated benefits. Yeah. Um, there is a bill that's been introduced in the Senate, SB 109, by Senator Scott Hammond, and it would essentially place cameras in classrooms, uh, special education classrooms where autistic children are being taught. Uh, children who, who can't really articulate when something bad happens to them. Uh, there's been a lot of cases covered by our I team uh, that, uh, that say that children were mistreated in, in Clark County uh, classrooms. Would you support that bill if it came to your desk? I'd have to see what the specifics of that bill were, and I have seen some of the coverage that you've had on, and uh, when those abuses are uncovered, it's uh, terrible. I mean, it's something that's very, it's despicable. But uh, the vast, vast majority of our teachers, our special ed teachers, uh, go above and beyond to make sure that there's a quality education and the kids are treated fairly. And I think these are isolated situations, even though there might be one or two, it's too many. It's one or two too many. But we need to be uh, realistic and I'd like to see what it says before I commit to signing it or not. Yeah. The, um, the, the, in, terms of, in, in terms of just the concept itself of having those cameras in there, you know, we have the vast majority of police officers are probably good uh, police officers, but we make them all wear cameras. So do you think it's appropriate to, to have cameras in there just as a, a, a basic concept? I don't know if we could isolate what rooms they should be in, if it just be some or should be all rooms. I, I don't have an answer for that till I uh, get some input from some of the experts in it. I don't know where people stand on this. Uh, the privacy of some of the students, how the parents would feel if they were constantly on camera, and they should certainly have a great deal of input as it relates to whether or not they're filmed and what happens to that film once it's, it's made and how long it's kept and who has access to it or those sort of things, and because that could be misused as well, so I'd have to wait and see how it all plays out. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate it. Pre pleasure.